going to be the first video, hopefully in a series, uh, that I'm going to call Tool Review. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the different tools in our fab, um, talk about what they do, um, and talk about uh, how well they do it. Uh, I've not seen anything like this on the interweb, so I think this will be kind of enlightening for other people who are in a fab or might want to buy tools in the future. Uh, unlike the tools at home, these tools cost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, so it's a whole different scale. And so when you invest in one of these tools, it's a big deal, usually with government money when you're an academic fab. So first tool we're going to talk about. This is a try-on, uh, we call it a metal etcher. Uh, it is a plasma reactor that is designed to etch all sorts of materials including metals. Uh, this is a combination of a reactive ion etcher and um, an inductively coupled etcher. Um, so it actually has uh, two power supplies on it. Uh, one that runs an inductive coil. Uh, it's a big loop of highly conductive material, probably silver, that goes around this reactor here. Um, and then there's a second power supply which drives energy between the plasma generated by the top coil um, and the platen where the substrate sits. Um, so by combining these two sources of plasma, you can tune things like, uh, well, first of all, you can get a higher plasma density than in a, what we call a capacitively coupled plasma, uh, which means higher etch rates. Um, also, an inductively coupled plasma can get you to lower pressures. And why is that important? Because the lower the pressure, the more directional the ions are going into your substrate. And what that means in terms of etching is that you get an anisot anisot anisotropic etch. So it's directional instead of etching the same rate in all directions. And that's really great. If you have feature sizes that are sub-micron and you want to, on your metal, and you want to uh, etch those lines with the greatest fidelity possible, you can use a plasma. It's much better uh, than a wet etch uh, because wet etch is an isotropic etch and it will sneak underneath your photoresist and uh, decrease your feature size. So that's one of the reasons we bought this tool. Uh, must be a decade ago at this point, um, was to uh, make photo masks. So we would uh, use our laser pattern generator, which is in the next bay over, uh, to pattern a photoresist on chrome. And then for very narrow line widths, this tool in principle would be used to uh, etch the photo mask with high fidelity. In other words, you know, if you have a 0.6 micron line width, uh, you get closer to a 0.6 line width, a 0.6 micron line width uh, using the plasma. Okay, so in each of these tool reviews, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to keep them structured the same way. I'm going to talk about uh, what the tool is, what does it do, what is it designed to do, um, how well does it do it. I'm using my notes. Um, and I'm going to discuss problems or challenges that the tool seems to have. Um, talk about how uh, good the support is from the company that made the tool. Um, I'm going to tell you how much we paid for it, as far as I know. Then I'm going to tell you, would we buy it again? Um, so I'd hope to start with a tool that I had nothing but good things to say about, but it just kind of worked out with that I was using this tool today and I thought it might be a good idea to uh, review this tool before I talk about some of the things we're using it for. Um, specifically today. Uh, this has, I mentioned, the two power supplies. Um, the uh, RIE power supply, I believe, goes to uh, 500 watts. Um, and the ICP power supply goes to about 600 watts. Um, we have a number of gases um, plumbed to this tool. Some really nasty stuff. Uh, so this tool takes uh, boron trichloride and uh, chlorine gas 
Those two are used in combination for mostly metal etching. Uh, BCL3 in particular is used uh, in aluminum etch to knock off the native oxide before the chlorine really starts to, uh, to etch the bulk of the aluminum. Um, we also have uh, CF4, uh, carbon tetrafluoride, and SF6, sulfur hexafluoride. Uh, these are your sort of standard um, silicon etches, silicon dioxide. Uh, I believe you can etch titanium with the fluorine chemistry. Um, we also have oxygen in here, so you can um, etch organics. You can process, in principle, you could process and etch a metal and uh, then immediately remove uh, the photoresist with an oxygen plasma without even taking it out of the reactor if you had a very well characterized process. Um, we also have CHF3, which I forget what that gas is used for exactly. Uh, but it's similar to SF, uh, C, CF4. I'll go over the, some of the recipes in a minute. Um, so this shows the sort of control panel. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Not sure how well my zoom is going to go. So uh, that's kind of what it does. Um, so you can see probably this green a little bit. Um, I'll get a good scan with the uh, uh, with the GoPro in a second. Uh, so you can set your ICP power, your RAE power, uh, your pressures. Uh, this will run in a range of pressures uh, from probably down to about four millitor and up to uh, you know several hundred millitor or maybe even higher. Um, you can use it with or without the ICP. You can use it in a purely capacitive mode, and that's really nice. So you can use it as a, a capacitively uh, coupled etcher. So it's, this tool in particular is very flexible. Um, so that's one of the great things about it. Oh, I should have mentioned it also has argon. Um, to keep the substrates cool, this is not an uncommon thing. It uses a helium gas on the back of uh, the substrate holder. Um, turns out helium is a surprisingly, has a high, surprisingly high thermal conductivity. Um, and so the platen, which you'll see in a minute, um, has a flow of helium gas uh, between it and a cooled electrode um, so that uh, your substrate doesn't get too hot while you're dumping maybe a kilowatt of power into it. Here's what the inside of the tool looks like. Just, uh, just FYI, I'm going to do OK to vent. So there's the load lock. You can see the arm going in in a second. That's the gate valve opening for the door opening. Arm goes in, gets our platen, which you might be able to see there. Um, and that, instead of a platen, that can be an 8 inch wafer. Now it is venting the load lock. That's the sound of the nitrogen hissing out of the load lock. And open sesame. Open. Open. Oh. Uh, okay. There's the platen. You can put a four inch wafer in there or more often we put little die pieces in there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how the chamber looks and that's how you load it. All right, so I'm good. I've removed my sample, closing the lid. This is another minor complaint. No mention of a pinch point here. Pretty dangerous actually. Okay to pump load lock, yes. All right. 
Okay, so let's just talk about some of the parts. I'm gonna film most of this on the GoPro. Uh, so let's see, so let's talk about the parts. Okay, panels off. Guess what, because we recently had to change the turbo, which is right here. There's a turbo controller there, nice Edwards uh, turbo pump, which is currently running at 48,000 RPM. And you can see that there's a backing line here. Um, there is a purge. A lot of these pumps um, that are pumping noxious gases pump a little bit of nitrogen in uh, to prevent the noxious gases from condensing. BCL3 in particular can be a problem. And I could probably talk about this problem forever. Uh, I could talk about this whole ad nauseum actually. So um, this is where the gas, the reactive gases go into the reactor itself. Uh, we had this uh, taped up with heater tape. This is a silicone heater tape. Never buy this stuff. It doesn't last very long and it's very expensive. Um, so just some word of advice from a fab person. Avoid these heat tapes on something that has to be heated uh, over a long period of time. Okay, and in here is the reactor, which I've shown on uh, social media a whole bunch. Um, I'll show it running in a bit. So here I'm going to uh, go around to the back of the tool into our chase area. This is where we do not allow our clients to come or our just typical users. So this is the chiller for keeping the substrate cool. Here's a uh, power distribution. Over here we have gas distribution with a bunch of lines going in. Okay. So this is the load lock pump. I guess I forgot to mention right here is the load lock pump. It is running. This is the uh, four line pump. This uh, is an oilless pump. It's probably a $20,000 pump. Um, used widely in industry these days. And it's uh, used to rough the chamber. Here's the back of the chamber. Um, it's used to rough the chamber down and then it backs the uh, turbo pump. Right here is a big gate valve uh, for isolating the turbo. And also, uh, it's continuously adjustable um, so that it's like a butterfly valve. <coughs> and so that is used to uh, control the pressure um, in the reactor. So it closes to keep the pressure up. So a quick word about boron trichloride. Um, one problem we ha people have with boron trichloride is that it, uh, here's another complaint with this tool. The screen's at a bad angle and you can't change it. Always get reflections on there if you stand at a certain spot. Anyway, boron trichloride condenses at room temperature and elevated pressure. So uh, for years what we did was heat all the lines, all the boron trichloride lines and the process gas lines with these crappy heaters that we have to replace every year or so. <coughs> but then a, uh, a group on the internet uh, called Lab Network told us, hey, just run it below atmosphere. So uh, turned out our, uh, our gas cabinet was already set up for below atmosphere operation. So boron trichloride is actually delivered to this tool at minus 10 PSI. And that helps it, that prevents it from condensing to a liquid and just messing up your processes. So that was just a, a real boon for us and saved us a great deal of money just to run, uh, run the boron trichloride through sub atmospheric regulators. <coughs> so this is the, an example of manual mode operation. So you have a recipe. I can change each of these parameters. I can, uh, this isolates the chamber. We go ahead and open this and you can see that the pressure is now reading zero inside uh, the chamber because it's no longer isolated from the turbo. Um, in this case, I'm getting set up to do 
uh, gallium arsenide etching. So I've been playing with this recipe. I have the ICP power set to 25 watts and the RIE set to 75. So what I can do is turn the gases on. <coughs> See if the pressure's gone to uh, about 6 millitor. The valve is still adjusting itself to get, try to get to that 5 millitor. <coughs> now I can turn on the RF. Excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold, and I'm not used to talking this much. So here's a big complaint I have with this tool. Um, first, some of the tuning is, you have to do a lot of manual tuning on uh, reflected RF power to get it to work right. The auto tuner is not great, but the big complaint is that either the measurement circuit for DC bias is uh, somehow flawed or that the tool is not actually uh, maintaining a decent DC bias. Uh, and that's super important. Let's go take a look at the plasma. Uh, and that is super, super important when you're trying to um, uh, anisotropically etch something because you want the ions to achieve a particular energy um, in order to drive them into the substrate with some directionality. So that's kind of a problem. Okay, you can see also that uh, I'm running helium cooling on the back side of the platen. So anyway, that's a quick, quick view of how it works, turning everything off. I'm going to go ahead and exit. Uh, the software is pretty straightforward, easy to use. I would add that I wish that their recipe, um, so to load a recipe from disk. So here's a bunch of our recipes, um, different things that we've etched over the years. Um, I do wish, so let's say, here's, here's gold chrome etch. Um, I just wish that they had some somewhere in here to uh, add some comments about the recipe. Um, so while we're on the topic of recipe, one of the nice things in principle was that this tool came with a lot of recipes, which are over here. Okay, you can pause and look at all these different, but you know, there's actually uh, a lot of ambiguity in some of these. Like they're not telling us flow rates. Um, they're not telling us what the DC bias should be. Um, and uh, I think when we got this tool, this company was still relatively new. Um, we went through and characterized aluminum etch rates, which is a little bit tricky because it has to be above, the platen needs to be above room temperature. Um, so anyway, I guess that's all I got to say about that. I, I wish the recipes had more detail when they came to us. Okay, uh, to summarize, uh, the tool, pretty versatile. Uh, we appreciate that about it. Uh, big downside, of course, is the tuning. Uh, the auto-tune doesn't work great. Um, particularly, I guess, at the extrema, the higher pressures, we seem to have particular problems. Um, and, of course, the DC bias measurement is not stable. Uh, whether that's due to the measurement circuit or actual fluctuations in the plasma, not entirely sure. Uh, although it does, once you have the recipe dialed in, it does seem to be relatively reproducible recipe and tuning. Uh, so maybe the fluctuations we see in the tuning or in the DC bias are really some artifact of the measurement method. Um, Though it would make it a lot easier to dial in recipes if we knew exactly what the DC bias was. Um, another minor complaint was that the uh, turbo failed. Um, to be fair, it was about 10 years old. And uh, also, somewhere back here we have a piece of paper that says never turn the pumps off because of the uh, corrosive nature of the gases. So, you know, maybe that was sort of our fault. Uh, 
not sure. Uh, so uh, customer support. Uh, Tryon, after 10 years, does call us back when we need help. So good job, guys. We appreciate the heck out of that. Uh, price. Uh, my sources tell me that 10 years ago when we bought this tool, it was about 252 kilobucks. Strikes me as pretty high. Um, would we buy it again? Well, we have other, there are plenty of other manufacturers of tools like this. Orlicon, Oxford, probably more. Um, we have a customer who is using an Orlicon system um, for their etching and they really seem to like it. It seems to be very reproducible. Um, so I guess it would depend on how these tools are being priced these days. Um, I sort of feel like when this tool was bought that uh, it was a deal. Um, probably cheaper than the others. I'm not sure. I wasn't involved in the purchase of the tool. Again, all opinions are my own and do not reflect my uh, employer or anybody else. Just my own opinion for what it's worth. Uh, so, um, you know, so I feel like this tool might have been uh, uh, a bit of a deal at the time, but not sure. All right, so I guess that's all I have to say about that. We'll see you next time. Peace.